Hello. The summary of part 1 has been left intentionally useless as a reminder to watch part 1 if you haven't. Cheers. Hello, my name is Hexabu again and welcome to part 2 of my deep dive into Baldur's Gate 1. And last time we stopped at a plot-induced return to the monastery castle of Candlekeep. We finally reached the homecoming chapter of our story and everything in Candlekeep is just as we left it, except that they won't let us into the barracks and the library door is invitingly open. We make an ugly face at the statue of Great Prophet Alando and then proceed to chat with the locals. Of course, they all jump at the opportunity to reminisce about all those times we embarrassed ourselves as a child, but there's also hints of something odd happening, with a bunch of guests from Baldur's Gate and an off-putting fellow called Korivas, who's been in the library a few times before and is a bit too interested in Alando's prophecies about the God of Murder Ball coming back to life. A few floors up, we actually meet Korovas, which sounds a bit too similar to Sarevok, the name of an allegedly charismatic and up-and-coming schemer who's lately been climbing the power ladder in Baldur's Gate, and who's signed some of our death warrants. So, Korovas, do you still send vials of blood to your uncle Alucard? He reveals that he knows way too much about how Gorion died. He clearly was the one wearing that huge suit of armor, and once confronted, he quickly flounces out. We continue upstairs and, wouldn't you know, find real-time the rest of Iron Throne's management board. Of course, they're on serious business here, and of course they dare us to come out of Candlekeep alive if we attack them, and then of course they need to die. The local cops are none too happy having to investigate a library slaughter, and so they throw us in the slammer. Sometime later, Tetheril, Candlekeep's second-in-command, comes in and waxes poetic about how we're Gorion's baby, and how the murders must have been a frame job, and how that cover us guy is slimy. Bro, I shot the guy in the face with this bow. No use at all, he believes in our better sides and just teleports us out of the prison and into Candlekeep's catacombs, which are roughly the same as an iron mine, except graves. It's full of doppelgangers, of course, who try to give us a sense of false security by pretending to be people we know. El Minster of all things, am I supposed to feel comfy around that horse old git? Have these guys even been briefed about their target? Might as well have appeared as dredged so that we can slice him with his own swords. But eventually we get out of the dungeon and into fresh air. It's Baldur's Gate and Saravok time. But before we go kill the armored devil, there's a detour we have to take, and it's called Tales of the Sword Coast. Today, you'd call Tales of the Sword Coast a typical DLC. It just adds a new village and a few new quests and no additions to the main story. With two dungeons, a crappy small one and a brilliant colossal one. But back in 1999, we didn't have DLCs. We had add-ons and expansions which came on their own CDs and Tales was another disc on top of the main game's deck of five that you had to ceaselessly shuffle in and out of your CD drive as you faffed about looking for adventure. Release right on the hills of Baldur's Gate's success, the expansion offers a little sidetrack into the business of saving the Sword Coast. For you, the player, Grindspawn, Ball's Ward, it means a new village, Algoth's Beard, just east of Baldur's Gate, where you meet Chandelar, a wizard that sends you on a quest to recover a cloak from a polar island with an underground facility that sucks in any mage that tries teleporting near it, as a sort of an arcane flytrap. The idea is pretty neat, and the dialogue with the insane wizards inside sure delivers, but the dungeon is literally the same as Firewine Bridge. Bridge. It's so much the same that when I whinged about Firewine Bridge in the first pass, I actually showed the new Polar thing. This is Polar, this is Firewine. Spot the difference if you can. Anyway, we're chucking this thing because it's a garbage copy pasta sideshow to the main attraction of the expansion, which is Durlag's Tower. In the village, we meet a dwarf who tells us about his relative's companion, Durlag. Some time ago, Durlag adventurized an immense treasure and built a little castle for his family on the Sword Coast. It'd be fine and well, but let's not forget, the place was and still is a frontier, and at one point, doppelgangers, it 
it's always doppelgangers, invaded it, killing and replacing Derlag's relatives. The clan went emergency mode, sealed the castle and trapped it all to high heavens. The story ends with Derlag going mad as he slayed the shapeshifters that looked like his family. And now his tower is a magnet for adventurers. Adventurers with a death wish. Since we really want to die, our goal is to recover the soul taker dagger, which contains the soul of the creature it is used to kill, and which now is home to the soul of a demon, which probably caused the whole shapeshifter attack and paranoia kerfuffle in the first place. So, we book a tour with a dodgy local travel operator, and we go to Durlag's tower. After one of the tourists trips a trap and turns into a pillar of fire, followed by a demon showing up and murdering the guide, it's clearly time for us to open the secret door in the basement and pillage the place unassisted. What unfolds in front of our eyes is possibly the best single piece of gameplay Baldur's Gate has to offer. To say that any combat area in the base game pales in comparison with Durlak's tower would be to still give those areas a huge compliment. A wild assemblage of diverse and tough enemies, different environments and puzzles and emotionally engaging lore, Derlag's Tower set the standard for how to do a big dungeon adventure in the isometric RPG genre that was still young in 1999, paving the way to the sprawling Watcher's Keep and Baldur's Gate 2, to the expansive undead infested crypts of Icewind Dale, and I'm sure creeping into the creative processes of level designers and writers ever since. Although, if you look at the notes I made playing it through for this video, you'll find one word. Traps! Yeah, the tower is infested with them and I'm not a fan. Of course, they make perfect sense within the lore of the place, and I cannot but praise the creators for actually using snares, tripwires, and crushinators to convey the sheer desperation of the people defending the tower. My opposition is on the level of game mechanics. Sid Meier, the creator of Civilization, is usually credited with the phrase, a game is a series of interesting decisions. I agree with it wholeheartedly, and this calls for a question. Do random traps on the floor in a dungeon create interesting decisions for a player to make. And I'd argue that in most cases, they don't. In Baldur's Gate specifically, and in the other games of its subgenre too. The closest you get to cool strategizing here is planning to have a thief in your party and giving them enough points in the find trap skill. Even if you come in prepared and expect traps to be around, you're looking at a repetitive sequence of move thief forward, wait for traps to light up, clear traps, move party, move thief forward, rinse, repeat. This is slowing you down for the sake of slowing you down. It's literal busy work that you have to do or you'll just reload all the time. This means complete bankruptcy for traps as a game mechanic. They present no interesting choices, while the frequent reloads mean that the fail states in the game are punishingly unacceptable and not interesting at all. Such wholesale carpet trapping as what you see in Derlag's tower can work if the area with traps is only one of the possible approaches to your goal, something where you can leverage particular skills in or avoid if you have other skills. In any case, I strongly believe that traps should come from a place of uniqueness, making the player figure each situation out rather than just go through the motions. Durlag's tower actually has an excellent example of it in its chessboard room. Fairly deeply into the dungeon, the party teleports onto a huge chessboard. Each character ends up in their own square and can only move in a particular way, just like a chess piece, or gets a deadly lightning bolt in the face. There's also enemies on the other side of the board and they're raking to kill you too. Any thoughts? This place sure makes you pay attention, turning the usual combat loop sideways as you frantically look for solutions in a situation where maneuver is suddenly such a pain. Huge improvement over click the red thing on the floor to make death go away, wouldn't you agree? But back in Baldur's Gate, our hopes of meeting friendly faces in the big city have been dashed, as Duke Elton is ill and Scar has been murdered, replaced by Angelo, a guy who finally takes our confessions about murdering the entire board of directors of Iron Throne at face value. He does throw us in jail, only to later kill the guards and let us go. Turns out his Shartiel's a strange dad. Aw, oh, you're such an unexpected treasure, Shartiel. Men are pathetic. Why? 
Why indeed! After wandering about the city and dodging the patrols because our reputation is getting a bit too spicy for the little rich girl in our team, we meet Tamoko, the woman that stood beside Sarivok as he killed Gurion. She's actually Sarivok's lover, but isn't too keen at how being a son of bull and everything is trying to become a god himself, which might cut into their sex life somewhat. He has also ditched her for another woman who is currently sitting at the top floor of the Iron Throne building and might have important documents. Sarivok himself is actually planning a coronation, as his political maneuvering and recent changes in city leadership left the position of the Grand Duke open for him to take. So we run through the now empty halls of the Iron Throne and meet Sathandria, a woman who clearly didn't get the hint from all of the dead bodies everywhere and now wants to kill us. Because she wants to be top girl in Sarivok's harem. Oh, look at him now, the Chad of Ball! Once we gleefully crush Sithandria's polygamous dreams, we find Sarivok's diary, where he talks about how he discovered and accepted his godhood years ago. About how he encountered us and saw saw us as a rival child of Ball with Garion, the filthy harper who caught the wind of why Sarivok was so interested in ancient prophecies. He explains all of his other plans to wreak havoc in the region, the plans that we've been wrecking all this time, the ultimate goal being to cause a bloody war for a carnage that resurrects Ball through Sarivok. His foster father, Realtar, became increasingly resistant to Sarivok's machinations, and so our half-brother arranged him a little meeting meeting with us in Candlekeep. This is an outrage! The full-plated asshole employs a horde of worthless assassins that lurk everywhere and jib at the touch of an arrow. And this one time, one time he gets someone good to do his dirty work and he does not even pay us! This is wage theft and it will just not stand! Sarivok must be stopped! Speaking of worthless assassins, we get a tip about a couple of his lackeys lounging with strumpets in the Blushing Mermaid Inn. I'm a fine-looking strumpet, ain't I? Oh, how convenient! They left an invitation to Sarivok's coronation on their bodies. I guess it's time to go there now! So, we get into the Ducal Palace just in time for the ceremony, where the nobles and the remaining dukes discuss politics and the possible, very desirable, war with Arm. We are clearly not alone in being bored by the verbal shuffling of the Ponzi aristocrats, as the shapeshifters in the room show their true form which seems appropriate as their life is about half a minute long from now on. All this bloodshed is a nice chance for us to break protocol and show Sarivok's diary to everyone and laugh at the dirty secrets Mr. Sinister Glowing Eyes has been writing down like a loser. This doppelganger fight is actually one of the most annoying fights in the entire game because of how many things can go wrong. The shapeshifters love chasing your squishier party members and ganging up on the dukes. And remember, at least one of those must survive, or you lose. Meanwhile, Sarivok loves to glitch out and outright refuse to fire his escape dialogue despite plentiful physical encouragement. So we flood the area with fast crowd control spells and keep an eye on our softer guys for a doppelganger blitz in a single room. But Sarivok teleports away, away into the forgotten shrine of Ball under the city. The one they rebuilt into another forgotten shrine of Ball just a hundred years late in Baldur's Gate 3. Anyway, the entrance to it is in the local chapter of the Guild of Shadow Thieves. And remember how I moaned about the dull, narrow corridors of Alcaster and Firewine Bridge? Now look at this rotten thing! You know what everyone likes? A trap maze level that is an actual maze! You may have noticed that I used cheats in these videos to remove the fog of war. It just doesn't look too good in the footage, and I feel totally vindicated for doing that now. Screw this boomer garbage, I'm tracing the shortest route to the end, and that's that. At first it was metaphorical mazes, now it's literal mazes. What's gonna come next? Drawing your own map? Anyway, we've reached the final level, and with a tiny bit of skeletal resistance, we're at the doorstep of the Shrine of Ball. There's another meeting with Tamoko, who wants to kill us all of a sudden, hoping for a chance to get another taste of sweet, sweet Sarivok. But that's just loser-level pathetic, so we just let her leave. 
Inside, it's all a matter of clearing the traps and quietly slicing up Saravok's mage. Saravok himself sure doesn't miss the chance to boast how he's the bestest bullspawn ever actually, but lured away from his throne, he quickly realizes that his show-off armor is no match to plus two arrows and dritz the word and swords. And so the dark giant falls, departing with his final and ominous words. You may not have accepted our father's gift, brother, but there are others like me who are willing. Enough deaths and Ball will be reborn. I won't bring him back with my war, but maybe you will with yours. Our father's blood runs true in your veins. Except that Saravog doesn't say it in the game. Those are his parting words in the Baldur's Gate novelization that we'll talk more about in a second. But you can see the suggestion in these words that Gorion's ward opposes his divine heritage and does his best to fight the blood of Ball inside him. And I've always felt that this is the default position assumed by the writers of the game as well. After all, it's very easy to realize that the story of Baldur's Gate follows the typical RPG clueless farmer to Chosen One Pipeline. You start naive, there's zero indication as to who you really are, and the plot very much steers you into your main decisions, all of which are ultimately heroic. You can hire evil companions all you want, you can be a dick in conversations and demand money for every little favor you do, but you will save Nashkel, you will destroy the secret Clerkwood mine, and you will make sure Baldur's Gaze avoids war with Amn. Which feels so limiting, given that the protagonist is a child of Ball, the vicious and violent assassin god of murder and deceit. Is there nothing in this character to push them in certain directions, to create compulsions, needs that are in line with Ball's divine portfolio? Shouldn't evil be the default in the game, and good be something that you always have to sacrifice something for, that you have to fight yourself for? While the game's sequels do explore this somewhat as Garion's ward approaches godhood, Baldur's Gate, the original, does not do that at all. We can play devil's advocate, of course, and say that the character starts young and their divine essence has not awoken yet, which I assume is the idea. But even as the game feeds you increasingly grim and gory visions, your attitude towards the world does not change at all. You just see vivid dreams and learn stuff about your dad, and continue with your investigation. It doesn't feel like you are a part of the Ball prophecy. It's not something that you can have a hand in, other than preventing it, of course. There is but one way, and don't you dare even conceive of anything like usurping your half-brother Saravok's achievements, rather than just destroying them. In Baldur's Gate, you may be a flawed hero, but you're always the hero nonetheless. It feels like a huge missed opportunity, and in a game that is a quarter of a century old, all that is left for us to do is to speculate why it is the way it is. One explanation I've seen for Bioware placing a straight heroic fantasy story as the plot of Baldur's Gate has to do with the satanic panic of the 1980s. Without going too far into it, I'm sure you've heard about all sorts of people frothing at their mouths, believing that heavy metal converted their kiddies to devil worship and such. Dungeons and Dragons became one of their targets, especially as a young fan of D&D committed suicide in 1982 and his mother did the good American thing and sued TSR, the owner of D&D at the time. She failed with that and later went on to campaign against DND and other wickedness that made Kitty Winks love the Satan. The point is that this atmosphere of persecution led to TSR implementing a code of ethics. Its multiple versions cropped up online a few years ago and it was presumably something anyone contracted to work on DND, be it books, games or campaign modules, had to sign. A quick look of it reveals that some of the clauses are disappointingly uncontroversial. Use standard language to write instructions. Alright, you fascist. Most of the rest is just your usual make it safe for the kiddies stuff, like no graphic display of reproductive organs or the prohibition of smut and vulgarity. But there are a few paragraphs there that insist on rigid definitions of good and evil, on how the struggle between the two must have a moral, didactic quality, on how the evil must never have a redeemable side to it, and how the protagonist must unambiguously be of and for the good. This actually does feel like 
like something that could have led Baldur's Gate to failing to explore the potential darker side of the main plot and its protagonist. But having looked at the whole affair, I'm skeptical as to how much of an effect that document may have had. It seems to have been dropped in the early 90s, and while it's something that may have been rippling into the future as unwritten rules and conventions imposed by those issuing D&D licenses, I dock them razor it and say that the developers of the game simply played it safe. Bioware was just a young team with one release title under their belts and wild ideas in their heads as they worked on something that at that point point was already very unconventional and ambitious in a dormant genre of computer RPGs. Something that, frankly, was too big for Bioware. To have a set of game mechanics meshing together in a satisfying system of complex moral choices, like at least what you have in Baldur's Gate 3 or Tyranny, would have probably been too far out there for the Bioware of 1998. And we know they got better, steering the plot in more interesting directions in the sequels and introducing various reputation and moral compass systems in Knights of the Old Republic and later games. This also further disproves the Code of Ethics hypothesis. Baldur's Gate 2 and Planescape Torment, both D&D games, came out soon after and they absolutely have moral ambiguities, potentially likable antagonists and darkness in the protagonists themselves. Also, there was something else full of sex and gore created and released at roughly the same time as Baldur's Gate 1. That's right, it's time for Baldur's Gate, the novel. According to the book's author, Philip Athens, he wrote this 90,000 word piece of fantasy between Halloween and Christmas 1998, and at the time, the only feedback he got from the people involved in the development of the game was telling him that the novel was fine. Just a few months after, in July 1999, the book showed up on store shelves and went straight into the hands of the fans of the game, a game that was already a big success and a modern classic. Predictably, there was backlash, there was meltdown, and there was fallout. And today, rated at 2.74 stars out of 5 on Goodreads, it's probably one of the worst books set in Forgotten Realms. So of course I got two copies, and as you can see, I've even read at least one of them. It actually took me months to pull it off the shelf and build up the courage to read it, because it ought to be shit. People on Goodreads can't just be wrong, can they? Can they? Well, people can indeed be wrong, but Baldur's Gate the novel is undoubtedly shit. It does deliver on the fights and the gore, though. What, haven't you ever wanted a jelly monster to digest ha 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 down to the bones in a battle near Berigast, then possess his skeleton to attack the protagonist only to get completely disintegrated by acid? Now that I want to try in the bloody game. And yes, Berigast, and yes, Halid. Despite what some reviews might lead you to believe, the novel offers a close retelling of the story we've looked at today and in part one. Athens wrote it independently from the game developers, but he had been briefed on all of the main plot points and characters. Ball must be stopped. Someone is sabotaging the iron mines of the Sword Coast, pushing powerful realms towards a bloody war and a young mercenary towards an unimagin... An, uh, towards an... an, an an unimaginable... Did they even read this thing? An unimaginable secret. Yeah, that sounds legit. Indeed, you hop from Candlekeep to Friendly Arms Inn to Nashkel Mines to Cloakwood to Investigating the Seven Sons, etc, etc. Most of the characters you see in the book are also familiar, from Garion and Saravok, obviously, to Zar and Monteron, to Scar and Duke Elton, to Yeslik, whom you meet in the Cloakwood Mines, and of course that crazy chick with spiders. Then there's also also Halid, who merrily dissolves an acid, Korax, the talking ghoul we chatted with once in the game and who weirdly becomes this critical golem-like secondary story driver, and notably, you will not find Imowen. It might be surprising given how significant she is in the plot of Baldur's Gate 2, the novel, SPOILERS, but in fact she was a late addition, brought into the game because at the last moment, Bioware realized that the player had no access to a straight, non-evil thief companion early in the story, and added this likable girl next door character, recycling the voice of a fighter companion that previously discarded. Poor sod. This is also why you don't see her interacting with other party members that much. 
late edition. And then she was retconned into a huge component of the entire saga. And then neglected again. And then turned out to actually not be straight. SPOILERS! But in any case, I don't see any point discussing the plot details of the novel, because they're exactly the same as in the game. Except... Except there's another important person missing. And it's the ball spawn, the Gorion's ward, our protagonist. Well, I'm exaggerating a bit, because the protagonist is there, but it is a different person. Instead of the wet-behind-the-ears, tenderfoot chap pushed for the first time out of the safety of Candlekeep, which we're so used to in the game, the book offers us a very different vision of Garion's ward. An inveterate mercenary soldier who grew up in Candlekeep, left it, and now comes back home after a few years in the sellsword industry. And he is a hulking beast of a man. Abdel was powerfully muscled, with chiseled features and ink-black hair he kept long to flow with the same fluid grace as his body. Abdel was nearly a foot taller than his adopted father, almost seven feet tall, and probably outweighed the monk threefold. Hey, doesn't this sound like a Fabio version of the Nameless One from Torment? So, meet Abdel Adrian, the canonical ball spawn of the Forgotten Realms universe. He is indeed canonical, all of you who choose to play as a dwarf or as a gnome. And he actually becomes a Grand Duke of Baldur's Gate after the saga is over, and I was a bit surprised not to find any references to him in Baldur's Gate the Third. But back to the book. Abdel Adrian is a contradictory character. He is both bad and good. Bad as in being a schlocky stereotype of roided monster pecs that carries a heavy broadsword on his back, and he just goes and smashes stuff he no like. And all of the women around him, provided they survive, immediately turn into screeching damsels in skimpy clothes. Specifically, Jahira, so fierce in the game, becomes just that once she tastes a piece of that delicious. Delicious Abdel. Khalid, well, he and Jahira explicitly and constantly cheat on each other and bicker about it in the novel. Plus, Khalid takes the acid bath eventually, so no harm, am I right? And that just scrapes the surface of the awkward stuff in that book, because sometimes it reaches the heights of the Eye of Argon, and indeed is reported to have been used for comical reading parties instead of it. You're probably now much more interested in finding out why Abdel Adrian is also good. And he is, in a way that makes me believe that for all its flaws, the novel has something of value to offer. Despite all of his hammy cheesiness, Abdel actually shows us a glimmer of what a proper evil-ish protagonist, a real child of Ball, should be like in the story. Abdel Adrian enters the story as a deeply conflicted individual who has a profound primitive darkness in him that he both happily lives and that he gradually realizes he should confront. For years, he has pursued a violent profession and thrived in the violent world around him. Go to a bar, get in a brawl, beat a guy up, kill him, leave. Go to the market, visit a shop, buy poison, because that'd be fun to kill someone with someday. That kill happens, and so on and so on. Abdel kills left and right because death just happens to fall into his lap, and he enjoys every second of it. You also see a more down-to-earth human side of this through his domineering personality. Later in the novel, he is revealed to be hated by his age peers in Candlekeep because he was a bully as a child. That's why they're so reluctant to let him back in now that Garion is gone. His trouble! And with this characterization, it's so much easier to see Abdel and Saravok as half-brothers, as products of the same bloodline, driven by the same enormous force they cannot fully control. Indeed, in later novels, just like in the games, Abdel resurrects Saravok and makes him his companion, a hulking giant of an evil twin, perhaps a touch too similar to Abdel for comfort. In the first novel, the only difference is that Saravok has learned what he is and is already working to unfold his potential. Abdel still just blindly experiences his essence and slices people up left and right for money, all fun without knowing yet why. As we've already discussed, Baldur's Gate the game takes a much more mystical approach to exploring the protagonist's nature. You know not what you are, 
and you don't live what you are, at least by the standards of the genre. It's just when your foster dad dies, you start seeing visions about some sort of a divine plan, and the person who is actually pursuing that plan even shows up in those visions. And then you get powers, worldly significance, transcendence, it's something that happens unto you rather than something you make of yourself. You are just swept by the course of the events to become a part of the prophecy, like a prophet of sorts, rather than being the prophet itself. The game insists on you being a bull spawn and competitor in chief to Saravok through plot reveals and the many assassins you face, but that doesn't square well with the rest of what the player sees in the game. With the fact that you are a nobody, a foster child in a monastery, someone who just gets religious visions. Compare this to Abdel Adrian, who's unwittingly become a force for the returning god of murder. He's big, burly, and a skilled warrior. He has built upon his innate tools and talents for ending life and doesn't need any dream-delivered invitations to use them. He is indeed someone worth sending assassins to from the outset, and in the book he eventually does find out that his personal essence, his abilities and proclivities are not a coincidence, that there is a plan for him and that he needs to decide what to do with it. And this decision is by no means straightforward, because Abdel was brought up by Gorion, who knew what Abdel was and did his best to counteract that dark nature. Abdul knows that he should stem his impulses sometimes. He values friendships and does everything to protect those he loves. These two parts of him are clearly at odds with each other, and this is the kind of personal conflict that offers incredibly fertile ground for storytelling, because the decisions in these conflicts are put in the hands of the character. The book squanders it all, of course, turning it into a clean woman teach moral, turn bad man good thing, as Jahira nags boyfriend Abdel into not doing so much gratuitous murder after all, whereas Sarivok and his liaison oriental stereotype Tomoko are just too filthy of a couple, so they fail. But... Jahira's butt. The game cuts out this whole conflicted aspect of its protagonist altogether, feeding you what essentially is a bog-standard CRPG story. But I'm happy to say that this video game saga takes a bit of a late bloomer approach, actually, as Baldur's Gate and Throne of Ball offer some of the better bits about Grind's Ward that we can find in the novel. But that's something we'll look at another time. This could have been the place where I said my goodbyes and teased the next video covering... Baldur's Gate 2 or something, but I'm afraid I can't do that. Not since 2016 anyway, and it's all the fault of Beamdog, a devilish developer of games that spun off Bioware and made an actual DLC to the 18-year-old game that Baldur's Gate was at the time. We'll talk about what this age gap meant for it, but Siege of Dragonspear, rather unfortunately abbreviated as SOD, Poor sod. came out as a bridge that firmly connected Baldur's Gate 1 to Baldur's Gate 2. The games of course shared the same story story arc and protagonist, but still left a wide gap between the death of Saravok and you ending up in the science slash torture dungeon of the series' next villain. So Siege of Dragonspear indeed finally ended the decades of incertitude and linked the two games with a cohesive plot that actually answers all of your burning questions. It also spawned an ultra dorky scandal that stinks of 2016 almost as much as Brexit and Pokemon Go. So much so that the DLC still has abysmal ratings on virtually everywhere. I'll give a general assessment of Beamdog's Uber when we talk about Baldur's Gate 2, so it's just Siege of Dragonspear that we shall dive into today. So Saravok is finally dead. What now? Siege gives us an answer as it takes us through what essentially is a newbie dungeon to warm us up and mop up Sarivok's remaining allies. With an imported character, this is the last time we'll see the party we travelled with in Baldur's Gate. The bulk of Siege of Dragonspear takes place a little later, as we dissolve the team, accept the title of Hero of Baldur's Gate, and lounge on our laurels in the city's Ducal Palace. All until a gang of assassins barge in, poop in the punch bowl, injure Imoen, and leave their sliced up corpses for us to discover evidence about those who sent them. And it was the Crusade. You know, the Crusade? The vast assemblage of various layabouts, conscripts and mercenaries that have been devastating the region we somehow never noticed before? All led by the chubby-cheeked Kayla Argent. 
She is an Alcima, which means that one of her ancestors did it with a Celestial. Boy, this one isn't gonna hide in the shadows anytime soon. Argent uses her racial charisma bonus to gather the filthy rabble around her and lead them to Dragonspear Castle, a place where it's particularly easy to travel to the Devil Plain of Avernus. The Devils have long used this wormhole to raid the Sword Coast for souls, and the Crusade's stated goal is to raid back, recovering members of so many families affected. Of course, the plutocrats in Baldur's Gate aren't too happy with the rabble being bad for the economy, plus the Crusade has created a refugee crisis in the city, and that simply won't stand. So a coalition of allied settlements arises to combat this evil, and we are asked to tag along. Our first goal is to bring the team back together, and Siege of Dragonspear trims the crowd of BG1 companions to 11, plus 4 new ones. Some of the old characters are just gone, others are there but aren't horrible, like Tiax, Imoen, or bloody Ski Silvershield, who becomes a plot device as she joins the Coalition force as a simple soldier, because she's too bored of her pampered life in the city. Demining duty in Derlag's tower and helping kill Saravok clearly wasn't exciting for her. Spoiled skidmark. But Beamdog really tried to flesh out those that did end up in the DLC, with extensive dialogue and reactions, both with the protagonist and amongst themselves, and of course, plentiful romance options. Essentially bringing the companions to the 2016 standard for the genre. So I had to assemble a completely new team. Given my love for ranged combat, Corwin or Varcha class was a perfect addition. Plus, she's a cop of the Flaming Fist variety and a single mother to a little girl. Actually, it's slightly unusual to have someone in the party who isn't a wanderer, outcast, or wackaloon of some measure, and actually has someone to return home to. Mazzy and Jan and BG2 have in-game families too, but it's still not your typical deal. Speaking of outcasts, we've got Viconia, a cleric of Shah hunted by her drow compatriots and pretty much everyone else. She's an absolute staple of the entire series, and a gorgeous appearance in Baldur's Gate 3. Since Ski left, we had to find another rich girl thief, so in came Safana. Jahira was another pick because she could handle her abysmal reputation, and I was still not done trying to make druids work. Finally, Edwin. Edwin, he's just a lovely man to be around. Yes, master. What should I fetch now? We also meet the hooded man who talks to us about how we're a child of Ball and how there's big things in store for us. Wait, aren't you the guy that that spider chick went nuts for? That's right, it's John Irenicus, the villain of Baldur's Gate 2, and he shows up throughout Siege of Dragonspear through visions and personal meetings carefully manicured to prevent murder hobo players from killing him. Hearing Irenicus' voice again is an absolute delight of the expansion. Soon it won't matter who comes. Even if the rules of suspense prevent him from saying anything other than platitudes about the protagonist's divine potential, he really, really wants his hands on it and finds natural allies in Kayla Rajant and the crowd. See, they did send the assassins, but not to kill us. They wanted to take our blood, because they needed divine blood to open the Dragonspear portal into hell. And who's that divine entity that they can draw the blood from? Of course, it's the guy who's just swept through the Sword Coast, massacring enemies left and right with a particular penchant for killing assassins, and who now has the full support of the city of Baldur's Gate. That guy. And not the billion trillion other bull spawns still roaming the continent since the death of the god of murder just ten years ago. I think this is the biggest weakness of Siege of Dragonspear. The story forces itself on the player, offering no compelling reason to actually go with the adventure. Unlike the main plot of Baldur's Gate, where you lose your home, your family, your safety, and there is someone clearly behind much of it. Stupid candlekeep rules, I'll burn your books, you hear me? Siege of Dragonspear throws a bone at you and expects you to bite. Except that the most reasonable choice would have probably been to go, this Ducal Palace is getting kinda dangerous, I better run with all of the immense riches I've gathered. Maybe south. A Catler looks nice this time of the year. You go with a story because it's a DLC that your mother bought you, and not because the protagonist has urgent internal motivation to. But motivation or not, you join the coalition and march out of the city to the cheering of the crowds. 
Coincidentally, the gloriously huge numbers of characters in a single screen is one of the outcomes of Beamdog effectively rebuilding Baldur's Gate from scratch, resulting in massive battles in a city that feels exuberant and alive, and like the seemingly self-isolating original. And it's despite the fact that you get access to maybe a fifth of the metropolis, and that the writing and what you get uh, leaves a lot to be desired. You know, you meet this very funny stoner bro in a tavern, and elsewhere you get rewarded with a gem that is heavily implied has been hidden up the grateful man's bum. Delightful. Anyway, the section between us leaving Baldur's Gate and us finally assaulting Dragonspear Castle takes up about 70% of the module, and it's mostly wilderness that the developers tried hard to fill with crusade skirmishes, side quests, story revelations, and solid Baldur's Gate 2 style dungeons. So let's look at a few highlights. We quickly reach a former temple of Ball, guarded by a sleeping dragon, who gets the immediate smack on the head. The place is very ironically and disgustingly taken over by the cult of Ball's killer, Cyric. The cultists themselves are mind-controlled by a chapter of sneaky illithids. Oh, how charming. It's layer after layer of people who need a good slicing. Plus, there's the rather well-endowed sibling of that dragon we flayed for scales. Hey there, I like what I see. Might you have a sister that's as gorgeous as- Oh, wait. Awkward. This place is a huge backstory revelation, because the temple is our true home. See, there's this cackling blind priestess of Ball left alive here for torture purposes. Don't forget, Ball fell just 10 years ago, and she tells us of Aliana, another cleric of this very temple, and our canonical mother. The spicy bit is that after she'd already had us, she had a romantic affair with a wizard called Gorion. <laughs> who was also a spy for the secretive and self-righteous organization called the Harpers. Gorion joined the eventual Harper raid on the temple, which resulted in the murder of Bull's priests and disciples, including Aliana, and in the kidnapping of most of the Bull's born children. Young Saravok was there and got left behind, Probably not cute enough. Neat in it. Your foster father kills your mother, kidnaps you, abandons an orphan, planting a seed of future devastation, and teaches you to betray your father. I promised you Shakespearean twists in part one, and this is some Hamlet shit right here. So next time you see the cutscene of Saravok slapping Gorion to death, give it another thought. Maybe the old swine had it coming. Oh, and if you play Baldur's Gate 3, make sure to kill Elminster. He's the biggest harp around there. Kill him for mum. Needless to say, we save the blind priestess and bid her glorious murders for Ball in her journeys across Faerun. Later, scouting ahead of our army, we arrive at the fabled Boriskia Bridge and find that the town of Bridgeford next to it is besieged by the Crusade. We sneak inside to meet Halid, who's in charge of the defense, and a known harper, and discover the many woes and side quests of those in the town. To make things easier, we just crash in the besieging camp, loudly declare that we are the bull spawn and that we've peed in the soup. Nothing lifts a siege like a good massacre. Boriskia Bridge is interesting for the fact that, during the Time of Troubles, it is here that Cyric, not yet a god, betrayed and killed Ball. Needless to say, crossing it deserves a cutscene, and this encounter marks a line for Gorion's ward. The line between being a clueless little grape to be crushed like everyone else, and finally grasping their origin and divine essence. Realizing that this essence has a will of its own, and that it attracts different people for different reasons. Meanwhile, we finally get to do a siege of our own. Perhaps even a siege of Dragonspear, maybe? After a bit of faffing about in the Coalition camp, we are sent to reconnoiter the defenders and sabotage their underground supply lines. Which, among other curiosities, presents us with a couple of incredibly friendly ogres that just lift us into the castle. We poison the food there, of course, and meet Kayla's right hand and advisor, Hefernan, who looks like a Kurt Cobain if he had a death metal phase. His room smells like Team Spirit, too. The game leaves clear hints that Hefe manipulates Kayla, but for now, he is spared a jibbing wrath, for this is just a raid, and the fun time can wait. We return none too soon, because there's a parley between Coalition's generals and Kayla, who clearly sees that the end is near and now begs the brass to lend her the child of Ball for just a week and return us totally unharmed. 
Oh, and that Assassins and Baldur's Gate thing. Turns out it's news to Kayla. Turns out it's Hethernan's doing. Womp. Oh, Hethe, you're so naughty. Anyway, the generals discuss handing us over to the enemy and decide to just take an old stick and give the crusade a good thrashing. Which soon follows as the crusade sally forth and try to overrun our camp. We take over the defense and allocate the available reinforcements to help us in various skirmishes. By the way, I absolutely love the dialogue-based battle decision-making allocating different squads to different fights. Even as shallow as it is in Siege of Dragonspear, games like these should have more of it. In any case, the enemy rolls back and Mobile Warfare Doctrine calls us for an immediate counterstroke into the castle. With the enemy weakened by their failed attack, by poopy diarrhea juice in their food, and by a little pruning we gave them on a scouting mission, we sledgehammer through the outer bailey and rush into the keep. Which is empty, as the remains of Kalar's army have locked themselves in the Avernus portal room. Surprise, Mama Jammers! Well, surprise to us, because Hefe, Hefe paralyzes everyone inside, draws up blood, opens the portal with it, and takes us all straight to hell. Though, hell is such a negative assessment. Avernus looks really warm and inviting, and lets you do what you love the most. Meet Devil? Kill! Devil? Kill! Talking Devil? Kill, kill, kill! Eventually we take a beat em up style lift to the final boss battle, and this is where the ultimate secret is revealed. Kayla Argent used to be a prodigiously nerdy little girl, and eventually she found devil books in the library. So devil they were that she eventually signed off her soul to Belly Fat, the devil in front of us. Kayla's uncle, Ayun Argent, found out about it and sacrificed himself instead of the girl, dooming his soul to an eternity working as a go-go dancer at the party in hell. The thought of missing out on the go-go dancing gig was just too unbearable for Kayla, who obsessed over it all the way into adulthood, so instead of therapy, she chose to assemble an army and take it all herself. And Hefernan, you ask? Oh, he's just a stinky goblin imp that made sure it all went to belly fat's liking. He may die now. And so may Belly Fat himself. This is actually one of the most rage-inducing fights in the entire saga, because he's immune to plus one and plus two enchanted weapons, and plus three stuff is virtually non-existent up to this point. Dritz, Doerd and Scimitars are plus three though. See how it all comes together? Remember to murder your popular heroes, children, so you can kill a big nasty devil later. Net positives. Net positives. With Belly Fat finally down and Kayla Argent left rotting in Avernus dead or alive, we return to Dragonspear Castle to a very surprised coalition. Which doesn't wait to launch the party anyway. Ugh, party. They don't even have a go-go act. But John Irenicus comes and poops on that too, setting up a little meeting with us and Skis Silver Shield, who too has been rebelling against the future her father has mapped out for her. One thing leads to another and soon the guards find us next to a stabbed Ski with her blood on our hands. The guards decide to be gullible about it because they take us back to Baldur's Gate for a trial in front of the crowds. I'm surprised they didn't have a noose handy there too, because the dialogue that ensues may be extensive, but it inevitably gets us on death row, in a cell in the all-too-familiar Flaming Fist prison. We do get a few visitors, including Irenicus himself, as he reveals how he stabbed Ski with a Soul Taker dagger. Yes, that Soul Taker, by the way. Her soul is trapped in it now, and she cannot be resurrected to testify. He also hints that this isn't over for us. And indeed it isn't, because Imowen hops in and busts us out. Oh sorry, wrong game. We run for freedom into the sewers, and there we face Corwin, who confirms she's just a copper. Oh, how nice it is to create an orphan and actually know about it. But the sewers end eventually, and we come to the rendezvous point where we find Imowen, Jahira, Khalid, Minsk, and Dinahair. All former companions and all received letters from the Ducal Palace urging them to come here. It wasn't Imowen's idea after all. So, what happens next? This ending of Siege of Dragonspear, I believe, is an exemplary way to retcon the canonical party of Baldur's Gate, which we discussed in part 1, into something that makes some sense, and it relieves this feeling that Baldur's Gate 2 forces specific, not even the best or most interesting companions on you for story convenience. Unless you deliberately avoid these characters, you are very likely to come in contact with them, and these people continue in your orbit in the DLC campaign. It's clearly John Irenic 
Atticus who sent the letters to these people, and he had his reasons to bring all of them together in your group, tying this loose end. But I don't think it's the best thing the writers of Siege of Dragonspear did story-wise, because they created one of the best antagonists I've seen in a video game. I don't mean Bellyfat, of course, he's just a devil in a known quantity, you lurks around, you meet him, you kill him. Kayla Rargent, on the other hand, proves an incredibly tragic character. From a fatal childhood mistake that torments her endlessly, to seeing her plans unravel, to being betrayed right in front of her eyes. She has all the markings of a pained, misguided anti-hero, but she still manages to be boundlessly insufferable. To the bitter end, she keeps making everything about quenching her guilty conscience, prepared to sacrifice everything and everyone, innocent or not, to achieve her immensely self-centered and ultimately pointless goal. This unflinching, supersized ego combined with monomania without any introspection is what makes a true villain. And the fact that the final battle dialogue has an option for Kayla to pledge eternal servitude to Bellifat as his blackguard is the expected true ending to the story of the chubby-cheeked Arsimar. Siege of Dragonspear is undoubtedly a wonderful addition to the saga. In a way, Sod feels like Icewind Dale if it came out in 2016. Just like Icewind Dale, it is an Infinity Engine adventure that has a more linear story and is more focused on combat than Baldur's Gate. Unlike Icewind Dale, Siege offers more colorful visuals and companions, and a lot more side questing. But then, they even share the same final boss, as Billy Fat is the antagonist of the year 2000 game, whose events take place far to the north a good century before Baldur's Gate. Siege also comfortably outweighs the comparably sized and linear throne of Ball standalone expansion to Baldur's Gate 2 in virtually everything, from the far more enjoyable item descriptions to a plot that doesn't consist of killing five sub-bosses in sequence to get to the final ultra-mega boss. At the same time, the DLC is somewhat hamstrung by the odd position it finds itself in. The 18-year gap between Siege of Dragonspear and the original game reveals a sharp contrast in design and mindset. It is an island of modern CRPG in a sea of the classic game, and inevitably it stands out despite trying to blend in. Its developers clearly were in love with everything Baldur's Gate and tried to connect the expansion to the entirety of the saga, peppering it with tidbits of ball lore and whipping up the ball spawn drama. This backfires somewhat. These revelations of the story of Ball's children and the game's world growing aware and highly suspicious of them, in the old games and novels all this happened much closer to the finale in Throne of Ball. The main story of the sequel, Baldur's Gate 2, starts with a protagonist that is still fairly unaware of their nature, exploring a world that still doesn't really care about the threat of the ball spawn. And remember, it's just days or weeks between the end of Siege of Dragonspear and the beginning of BG2. Is it selective amnesia for the protagonist and the world at large? So ironically, the expansion that was intended as the final link between the two classic games, and that certainly succeed in doing so, brings a bit of a mismatch of its own. However, being this link, it needs both of these games to exist around it, so we get a brilliant piece of 2016 stuck in between two chunks of Y2K gaming. It offers a marvelous example of the contradiction every attempt to revive and expand on a classic has to face, as whenever you purport to marry something new with something from the past, from 20 years ago, you crash nose first into the reality of that past simply no longer existing at all. Even in memories, as memories are flawed, all cultural items are ultimately human-centric, and humans move on whether they like it or not. Even the die-hard fan who's been playing nothing but Baldur's Gate all this time, even and especially Beamdog's developers who actually worked on the original games. So to give it a fair assessment, we need to accept Siege of Dragonspear being this odd-looking pimple on the, let's not kid ourselves, not exactly smooth face of the Baldur's Gate saga. There's also the question of what Beamdog was supposed to do. The protagonist ends BG1 as a clueless knob, and starts BG2 as a knob just as clueless. So you have two alternatives. Create a story that is completely orthogonal to the saga, where Grimes Ward does adventure, but remains a knob, or create a story that fills the gaps and explains the saga, but maybe makes it slightly less consistent with later events that were imagined decades prior. 
The bottom line is that Siege of Dragon Spear is an excellently done CRPG module on its own, with a better story than the contemporaneous snooze fests of Pillars of Eternity and Tides of Numenera. It is hampered by the legacy combat obsessed wreck that is D&D, and it inevitably heavily relies on the strengths of the main games, but thankfully neither of them is too difficult to love. And this is the end of the video. If you have listened this far, HOW DARE YOU! This is all for my ears only! But do stay tuned, because in addition to other games from the turn of the 21st century, we will look at the rest of the saga with Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Ball, as well as a bunch of other topics that did not end up in this one, including bits and pieces from the history of Bioware, Black Pits 1 and 2, an overall assessment of Beamdog's work, and maybe a little probe into the more annoying elements of Dungeons & Dragons. Cheers.